Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and welcome everybody to the October, it is 3rd, 2023, meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Uh, this is our, as planned at least, is our penultimate meeting. Um, and uh, really look forward to working together on on um, sort of a these two next meetings on a final run through of the bylaw um, and discussion as we go along. So we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but first, um, Jan, are you good with the minute taking? Yes. Great. Thank you. I don't think I'll have it by next week, though, unless something cosmic happens. So um, we'll have the recording um, for. We'll need, well, we'll need to, but you as a group need to vote on them. So we're going to have to have, there's another set of minutes that are outstanding too. And I think I might have to be the one to pull those together uh, for the, I think it was back in May. It's been a while or May, I'm sorry, August 4th, not May, August 4th. So I can, um, I'll pull those together for next week, but I think we're going to need to have them. I'll try. It. I'll do the, I'll do my best. I just have like planning board stuff and it's like a busy week. Okay. And just logistically, Stephanie, how do we then deal with the meeting? I, I don't know. It's our last meeting. So I think we have to have those minutes approved. Um, right. But then how about the minutes for the last meeting? <laughs> oh, um, Martha seems to know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. All I'm going to do is ask. It would seem to me just based on where we're at, that we would need an additional meeting, maybe if it's only a brief meeting, just to kind of summarize things, maybe take care of the last minutes, but, you know, see if there's any loose ends. But also, I think we need to be told what's going to happen next. What's the process? That's when on the agenda for next time. Disbanded, et cetera. Uh, so I would suggest that we leave open a possibility for a short additional meeting, but. I agree. Yeah. I don't know that you're going to get everybody. Um, so anyway, we can try. It wasn't easy to get the quorum yes. you know, to get yes. everyone for this one. But that's the process is on the agenda for next time, Martha. That's actually oh, part okay. of the next meeting. Oh, okay. So I mean, what I would suggest is maybe if you want right. to make the next meeting a little longer, you could do that. Okay. That's an option. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so let's plan for one next meeting, but um, be aware that uh, if conditions unveil themselves that we need some additional time for another meeting, we'll we'll work on that. But let's plan to be done at the next meeting. Okay. Um, all right. We have an agenda for this meeting, uh, which is fairly standard agenda. Um, the first is to review and vote on the minutes. Um, again, we don't have, then it is August 4th. Uh, we don't have those minutes still, uh, but we do have the minutes from 915 um, that were in our packet. And anybody have any edits or questions on that, uh, Bob? Yeah, they're my minutes. And yeah, I just okay, and thank to, you for that. Yep. There were, I had just, there's some italics in there, which is just a comment to Stephanie. They should be deleted. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see that on the uh, on the first page there under draft bylaw topics for discussion. I'm sorry, we had minutes in our packet? Or this is this leftover? No, these were the minutes from uh, our last meeting, actually, September 15th. Oops, OK, sorry. I, I didn't read them. Do we have enough to vote on them without me? Uh, yes. If we have a motion. We have a mo you could you could have a majority of the people present so that could work. Um, do I hear any more comments? Um, uh, Bob, I see your comment. Stephanie, did you take note of that in terms of just finalizing the minutes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, please, Jack. I just wonder if we could get a, a, like a couple minutes just to to skim them. Yeah. Do we, do you want me to put them on the screen? That would help me. I've got them. Um, okay. A very fast reader. <laughs> you have it, Stephanie? Yeah. Just give me a second. Sorry about this. 
just making them bigger so you'll actually be able to read them. Okay, just give me one second. Um, my name is McGowan, not McGuire. Although it's, a, it. it's a I fine got name. It. It's a fine name. I got it, Janet. This is Jack. Um, what's the discussion of WG charges on the second page, middle? Look, you scroll past it. Right, the bottom line right there. That's working group charge. Oh. Okay. Where is yeah, okay. I can type that out. Yeah. Well, I, I would just so what I've been used to solar SBWG, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Martha. Yeah, back near the beginning in in it said I I mentioned uh a report on the town master plan. That was that Chris was going to be giving her annual report to the uh town council, I think. Is that right, Chris? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I've got that as well. Great. Any other suggestions or edits? Uh, back to committee updates that uh, did we discuss? Martha's uh, mentioned the math. There's the question marks at the end of that. Yeah, that that's the, that's the, because it wasn't clear where it was going to be presented, I guess. And I, yeah, just, I, I, I missed was just, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a great note taker. It, yeah, it was going to it was going to be at uh, at the town council meeting. So you, you want to know what date that was? Okay, I will tell you. That was September eighteenth. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. I've got it. So with that, I move that we accept the minutes. Okay, I'll second it. Thank you. I'm just going to close them to get everybody on screen. Okay. And in no particular order, Gregor? Uh, yes. Brooks? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Hannah? Yes. And McGowan? Yes. All right. Minutes are approved. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, any staff updates um, from uh, uh, Stephanie? No. No. Okay. Uh, Chris? Yes, I have an update, which is that the planning board will be um, receiving a presentation about the Shootsbury Road solar project um, tomorrow night, Wednesday, October 4th. And the meeting starts at 630. And um, most of the meeting will be devoted to that topic. So the planning board's role, just so everybody knows, the planning board is not in a permitting role for that project, but they are being um, asked to make uh, recommendations if they see fit 
So they're receiving a presentation and if they would like to make recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals, they are welcome to do so. Great. Is that meeting accessible by Zoom? Yes, it is accessible by Zoom. And um, just to let everybody know about public comment, the, the chair of the um, planning board accepts public comment at the beginning of the meeting on topics that are not related to items on the agenda. And then um, during the meeting, after a presentation and questions by the planning board, the chair welcomes um, public comment about that particular topic that was just presented. So just wanted to let people know that. Great. Would you be able to distribute the Zoom link? Um, or is that on the website? Is that on the town website? Oh, it is on the town yeah. website. Okay. It's on okay. it's yeah. on the agenda for um, the planning board meeting, gotcha. which okay. should be on the town calendar. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Anything else staff update wise? Nope. Super. Um, any committee updates? Um, solar, of course, the biggest one. Uh, the Royal Supply uh, Protection Committee met, um, and I presented what we had, you know, where we're at at this point with this with this group. Um, so that's it. Good. Any feedback or comments that are germane to? Uh, well, I mentioned the stormwater part, and you know, and. Uh, and you know, just some of the 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 math associated with a private well versus a a you know large volume public drinking water well with regard to the setbacks and that, which everybody you know was on board with. Uh, I'm probably missing something, but <laughs> all right, thank you. Yeah. All right, super. Um, yeah, nothing from ECAC to report. Um, okay. Um, all right, uh, let me just say just for the record, um, we have 12 attendees from the public, which is, is great. I think it's a milestone because I think that's maybe the first time that public attendees outnumber the panelists. So that's good uh, for both uh, this and the ECAC <laughs> committee I'm on. So great. Um, okay, and appreciate your attendance. Okay, um, the bulk of the meeting, uh, my suggestion, uh, is that we uh, really do a read through, uh, beginning from the top to the bottom, uh, recognizing that there are a couple areas where we know we're going to have to have some discussion. Uh, I'm thinking particularly about the storage section. Um, and then second, um, probably firming up and, and uh, uh, any, any uh, remaining issues uh, with regard to forest and farms, uh, which I think we discussed and resolved to the to, to the most part last meeting. Uh, but there may be some remaining issues there that we need to hone in on. Uh, but I think it'd be best to start from the top and discuss those issues as we get to them. Um, and um, uh, and we have basically today and next meeting, Tuesday, if I recall. Or was it Wednesday next week? Um, to um, to get through this as comfortably as we can. Uh, I don't want to put out any misinformation for the public as well. So the next meeting is uh, uh, sorry, to, yeah, indeed Tuesday at ten o'clock. Um, so how does that? So folks, yep, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but currently that meeting is 11 to 1. Are you wanting to start an hour earlier or extend an hour later? I know we just discussed that possibility for the next meeting, but there wasn't a decision on it about what time that would start. Okay. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, for some reason, I put down on my calendar 10, 10 to 1, but maybe that was a mistake. I put, I put that on my calendar myself. I did it quickly. So maybe it was 11 to 1. Is that what your notice said? Yes. Yeah. If um, so, yeah. That for me, uh, re uh, just a reminder. I'll be um, tuning in from California, uh, from a hotel room, but it should work out. Um, 
And so uh, 11 o'clock works out well for me. Um, I'd rather, if we do want, if we do want to extend it, I'd rather extend it at the beginning than at the end, uh, just to get my day started. What, what day is the next meeting? Tuesday, October 10. Oh, there it is. I'm good for earlier. We'd have to confirm with um, Laura and Dan as well. But anybody here um, have an objection to starting at 10? No. Martha, you okay? She's on mute. <laughs> okay. And uh, I don't think we can commit to that. Well, what's the issue? We need to firm this down, but I'd like to get Laura and Dan's input on that i i know that they're both available at least from 11 to 1. i don't know if they can be there at 10 but essentially you really just need a quorum at least to start they can always arrive if they can't make 10 they would certainly be able to arrive at 11. so um you could as long as you have a quorum you can start at 10 um but you all have to decide right now if that's doable you might want to have a a vote to see who can make it um, I think everybody said they could make it. I think we yeah. maybe a, a vote that we want to make it. <laughs> hey, I just didn't hear Martha. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, I yeah. meant to get my calendar. Yeah, I'm okay with 10. I have an okay. appointment okay. too that I'd have to leave at quarter two. Yeah. I mean, given what's in front of us, I if people can um, manage a marathon, um, maybe we'll take a break in between, a 10 minute break somewhere in between, in the middle. Um, I'd rather uh get started earlier um and um uh uh be make sure that we have enough time or plan to have enough time so any obje any uh, any objections to starting at 10 o'clock all right mm -hmm. i'm not sure if we need a vote then stephanie um good. okay great so let's re post that or whatever if you've done um and then um correct it uh, and, and make sure that um Dan and Laura are um, informed about that and, and just fingers crossed that they can make it at 10. Yeah. All right. Uh, but could I request that oh, yeah, for, okay. for that meeting that we have a more detailed agenda? I mean, like Stephanie, you've already said, we're going to discuss the the ongoing process or, you know, if it turns out that there's one particular session that we really have to focus on, if that could be get listed. So anything that's specific uh, might be helpful to just state in the agenda. That's up to Duane. And um, it's already the other agenda, just because usually at the, our current agendas have been pretty consistent at Duane's request. Um, and they always say next steps. So instead of next steps, it says um, process. It's discussion of process. So it's so rather than identifying the agenda items for the next meeting, it's just talking about what's happening next. Yep. Okay, great. Um, unless there's any objection, I'd like to um, move over to starting to review the bylaw sort of from top to bottom. Um, I think some of these parts we can go through fairly quickly, um, uh, but we'll leave that up to you. I do uh, recognize that we did receive some um, comments from Bob Wright, um, I think earlier today. Um, so I look, I've looked at those and we can just deal with those edits and comments you had, Bob, as we get to those points in the, uh, in the draft. Um, so. Chris, are you prepared to sort of um, read us through? I am prepared. If someone else can share their screen, though, because I'm yeah. close yeah. at that. Jack. Can... Jack, you're muted. Yikes. Uh, I'm wondering uh, to say, Chris, maybe one of us could each read a page and just kind of rotate through it versus Chris kind of having to, to do all the reading. I don't know if that would, you know, save you a little bit of... Okay. That would be helpful, and especially because I've been coughing today. I don't think I'm sick, oh, okay. but I have okay. been coughing. So 
I'll start out and then somebody else can take okay. up. The... Yeah. Yeah. Good, good idea, Jack. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, can I ask, are you wanting me to open the working copy? Yes, please. The annotated. The working. Okay. working copy. And I'll talk about the annotated as we go along. Okay. Okay, great. Or actually, and, uh, I'll introduce the annotated. Um, right. But bring up the working copy. Okay. And while that's coming up, Janet has a comment. Are we, is Chris literally going to read every line of this 22 page draft? Well, my recommendation, uh, as I expressed it to Chris and Stephanie, was to um, probably some of it, like the definitions. I'm not sure if we need to read the definitions verbatim. Uh, other things maybe uh, we can just put on the screen and 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 read through ourselves quickly um, and 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 see if there's any comments on them uh, as opposed to reading it through if we think that's quicker. Um, I'll kind of leave that up to the group and to Chris um, as we get to those places. I do want to try to certainly be as, as efficient as possible. Um, and yeah. So no, I understand the the balance that you're trying to strike. I had I have like a bunch of edits. Some of them are just edit, like little um, proofreading things. I just assume I would send to Chris later. But I I um, but it, if it's useful for everyone to read through it. But I just I was hoping we wouldn't have to unless we're at the, like the newer sections are kind of rougher. So they I would see a line by line on that. Just a, just a suggestion. So. Um, I have made changes to many of these sections because as we've gone along, I've received comments from people. I received comments from Bob Brooks, uh, Janet McGowan, um, Martha Hanner, and also from Doug Marshall, who's the chair of the planning board. So um, I had um, asked Stephanie to post, along with the rest of your packet material, an annotated copy and that copy, the last date for that is September 12th. And that included all of the comments that I had actually had included. Um, it was September 20th, I'm sorry. Um, so as of September 20th, that annotated copy included all of the comments that I had received from those people. And um, some of the suggestions for edits I included in the working copy and some I didn't. And um, I did write in the annotated copy my response to the comments. And so if people want to read through the annotated copy on their own, I think that would be fine. And if anybody who submitted cop uh, comments wants to bring up their comments while we're going through this, that's fine also. But I just wanted to state that um, we haven't actually read this recently. so. The fact that I've incorporated people's comments means that things have changed. And I agree with Dwayne. We probably don't have to reread all of the definitions and probably the nexus statement can wait for next time. But it probably would be a good idea to read through things like the intent and purpose because there were several lines of um, material added to that section. So, yep. yeah. So that's Great. all I have to say. Yep. All right, so let's um, let's hear from Martha and then Jack. Uh, I think that's a physical hand up, a real a real hand. Uh, and, <laughs> Thank uh, you. I, I just wanted to request whether you could enlarge the yeah. the copy on the screen so that we could actually read it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank okay. You. Jack. Yeah. I just I just want to say I'm, I'm I really uh, am relying on this as as in terms of me reading the bylaw because I've not I've not been able to to dig into them to the extent that I would like. So I appreciate us going over it in the detail that you're suggesting. Yeah, perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, should yeah. I should yeah, I start? Go ahead, Chris, and then um yeah, hand it off uh, when you're ready. Hand it off to to uh, a next reader. Okay, when I start coughing. Uh, <laughs> so all right, intent and purpose. Um, the purpose of this article is to promote the health, safety, and general public welfare by promoting and regulating the creation of new large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations, LGPI, by providing standards for the placement, design, construction, operation, monitoring, modification, and removal of such installations. So this is one uh, place where the planning board chair suggested 
shortening the um, acronym to LGPI and leaving out the word solar because he said photovoltaic implies solar. So he suggested large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations, LGPI. So that's what I've used throughout this. Okay. Um, the town of Amherst recognizes the urgent need to convert to non-carbon energy sources to promote solar energy development and to sequester carbon to slow and reverse climate change. This bylaw aims to balance multiple needs. Can you uh, scroll down a bit? Yeah, that's good. Um, then these are the need for non-carbon forms of energy generation and storage to meet climate action goals, the need to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the town of Amherst and the region the need to preserve the natural environment, protect sources of carbon sequestration and storage, and minimize impacts on scenic, natural, and cultural resources, the need to preserve prime farmland and provide for local food production. Oh, Martha, uh, Janet has her hand up. Go ahead, Janet. So in the, um, in the inoculation, um, purposes of inoculation from a court challenge, I thought that um, when you said natural and cultural resources, you could add residential neighborhoods because the SJC has recognized like maintaining the integrity of neighborhoods and zoning districts is as a legitimate concern of towns. And I thought that would maybe address the buffer zone issue or um, so just like a, a nod to that to sort of support buffer zones or whatever other things we do. Okay. Anyway. All right. Where were we? I think we were on um, the need to implement the goals of the state's climate action plans and resilient lands initiative, the need to provide adequate financial assurance for the eventually decommissioning of such installations, the need to recognize the rights of landowners to use their land. I think Jack had his hand up and he's muted. muted. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, I just saw a decommissioning, and before I was, I saw removal. I'm wondering if if one should be consistent in terms of, you know, we're calling the removal. Should we just say decommissioning these things throughout versus removal? Small, small thing. But I, I again, I have not. I don't know how consistent it is. But to me, it seems like decommissioning is the right word. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where did I say removal? Uh, the first paragraph. The I see. Okay, yeah. so decommissioning. Uh, decommissioning instead of removal, okay. Yep, good. Um, so the need to provide fin uh, adequate financial assurance for the eventually decommissioning of such installations, the need to recognize the rights of landowners to use their land, the need for farmland and agricultural soils to produce healthy food, food products, support farm to table dining, farmers markets, provide jobs and support the local economy. The need to protect forest resources that support the local economy, produce wood products, provide the critical ecosystem services of purifying and storing water, purifying air, producing oxygen, sequestering carbon, habitat for wildlife and plants, recreation, lower air temperature and mitigating climate change. Um, the need to implement the goals of the state's climate action plans and resilient lands initiative goals to protect and expand natural working lands and of no net loss. So that would be the goal of no net loss. Um, the need to implement Amherst climate action and resilient plans goals of streamlining, streamlining permitting, facilitating emissions reductions, encouraging responsible siting, ensuring the highest and best use values of natural lands and protecting wildlife habitat, agricultural productivity, flood storage capacity, and other ecosystem services. So somewhere along the line, uh, I think it was one up. Yeah, can you go back at one? Um, Bob sent in a comment that he thought that um, this last item on page one was redundant. Yeah, yeah. So we can strike that. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Um, yeah. Chris, it, it, I had sent um, a comment, I think, uh, a few days ago where I 
uh, had combined that language with the with the language above. You know, it was redundant, and I combined the two a little bit. Just I was out of town for um, a day. Yeah. I went to a funeral in Cleveland, and um, so yeah. I may have missed a couple of emails. Yeah. So if you want to send me that language again, yes. I can. Um, yes, but it was just that. You know, taking that one that was that Bob just said was redundant, and and putting it together with the one above. Okay, so look at Martha's rewording. Yeah, this, the second entry has a little bit more information. Yes, yes, but you could just, you could phrase. Yeah. I, I quoted the phrase of no net loss specifically from the document. Okay, that's good. So I'll look at the, that email. Can you send that email to me again? Yeah. So I, I'm sure I'll find it. Okay. All right. And, um, and do put your hand down. Try to remember to put your hand down. If you already were, oh, okay. I don't know, Jen, if you have it up again, but um, Jack, I know yours is no. Yeah. So uh, with the go to the bullet right above the, the need to protect forest resources, for me, I think we need to protect uh, all natural resources in the town, including, you know, the wetlands and things like that. And, you know, because I'm looking at this and I say, but wait a minute, many other resources in the town uh, do these things. It's not just the forest. Yes. So I'm wondering in terms of, the need to protect natural resources, uh, you know, including forests, that's yeah. locally company made, uh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But, um, I mean, there's nothing about forests that, that to me, you know, purifying and storing water that, you know, doesn't really resonate with me as, as their function. Um, so I'm just trying to make it a little more general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would read then the need to protect natural all natural resources in town, including forest resources. Is yeah, that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. That includes the wetlands, which we yeah. know are important. Correct. Okay. So now go into page two, please. Um, this article strives to regulate solar and energy storage facilities in order to encourage solar installations to be installed on built and previously degraded environment environments to the extent technically and economically feasible and to control negative impacts on areas such as forests and agricultural lands, natural and working lands. This article balances the critical goal of increased solar energy production with reasonable regulations, thus serving to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of Amherst residents. This article encourages the use of solar energy systems and solar access consistent with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Sections 3 and 9B, Solar Access, 18, and the Green Communities Act, MGL, Chapter 25A, Section 10. This article implements the, the Amherst Master Plan, the Open Space and Recreation Plan, and the Climate Action and Adaptation Resilience and Resilience Plan, and the Massachusetts 2050 Decarbonization Roadmap, Clean Energy and Climate Action Plan for 2025 and 2030, and Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2050. This article strives to encourage and regulate solar and energy storage facilities in a manner that reflects the equity and justice of impacts and opportunities across all sectors of Amherst's residents with particular concern on our low income and marginalized communities. I think that should say to our low impact rather than on. Mm -hmm. um, the provisions set forth in this article shall take precedence over all other less restrictive sections of the zoning bylaw in the regulation of LGPIs. Okay. Does anyone have any comments on that? Okay. Applicability. Um, this section applies to LGPIs proposed to be constructed after the effective date of this section. This section also pertains to physical modifications that materially alter the type, configuration, or size of these installations or related equipment. The requirements of this bylaw shall apply to an LGPI regardless of whether it is the primary use of the property or an accessory use. This bylaw is not intended to regulate systems of less than 250 kilowatt direct current uh, kilowatt direct current DC roof mounted systems or solar parking canopies. So that's a question. Is that what you mean? You mean to regulate only ones that are ground mounted, not roof mounted and not solar parking canopies, right? Just want to confirm that. So. 
Okay. Yep. Um, I would just, um, I would just strike out parking under the can for the can canopies. Um, no, I think. I'm, oh. I'm a, okay, because it could be can canopies over yeah. something else. Exactly, and and yeah, we we made that mistake at DOER, and then we had canopies that were not over parking. Oh. Uh, so what we, would, uh, for example, uh, other than parking, like a walkway, for okay. example. Okay. Roadway, yeah. Okay, this bylaw is not intended to regulate solar panels installed on buildings. Such installations are permitted by right with a building permit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we decided that we're going to skip over Nexus statements for now. And so we're going to go on to page, uh, let's see, we're going to also skip over definitions. Yeah, so I think, cool. yeah, I would just say Bob had, there's one thing oh. Bob had that was in the definitions, which we might cover. Um, yeah. Uh, I can look at that real quick. Oh, he questioned oh, ecosystem service. Let's yeah. see. An ecosystem service is any positive benefit from natural lands that can be, that can include, but not be limited to oxygen production, air cooling, air and water quality, purifying, water storage, flood, and drought mitigation. So he added the words and not limited to but oxygen limited. production. And then he added water storage, flood, and drought mitigation. So that, I you just change the ampersand to an end. Yeah. Amp. All right. Okay. So I'll include that in the definitions. Mm -hmm. uh, just okay. And then, yeah. then he also, under solar energy, um, which we defined, I found this definition somewhere, radiant energy received from the sun that can be collected in the form of heat. And then the definition I found included light heat or light, or converted to electric power by solar energy systems. So he um, suggested that we eliminate the word light. I guess maybe I would, I, I think. Where, where I is that? Maybe correct. It's on page, uh, what page is that? And you, can you scroll it to make sure we are seeing it? One Definitions. It's page five. I think it's five, yeah. And it's solar energy. The definition solar of solar energy. energy. I would just maybe um, shorten the definition to be that can be collected um, and converted and converted to electric power by a solar energy system. And converted to electric power by a solar uh, energy I mean, system. Okay. Once you said radiant energy, that that covers both heat and light, right? Yeah. <laughs> the only yeah. difference between what we call heat or light. Is, is just the difference in wavelength. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's it's not really a difference. Yeah. So, so radiant energy you see from the sun that can be... The, so if you just say radiant energy received from the sun that can be converted to electrical power by a solar energy system, right? You don't need it in the form of heat or light. Yeah. Do you want to include collected, though? I think okay. so. Collected, I think collected so. and converted. Yes, yeah. collected and converted, yeah. Okay, that's good. So were those the only... Yeah, there was just a very to... quick one on the very first definition of agrivoltaics. Oh. Um, he, he suggested, I, I think it's good, uh, the simultaneous use of land for both solar... Uh, so scratch the words areas of of land for both so okay yep yeah all right all right any comments or thoughts questions on the definitions i see janet and then jack um so i wondered um later on there's there's reference to um heavy rainstorms or heavy rain events or significant rain events I forget exactly the language, but I began to wonder, I began to think we should define what that is early. Um, and I think um, Kip Kolansinkas, whose name I can't pronounce, was suggesting like more than a half inch of rain in a 24 hour period. And I don't know if that's what we wanna pick, but I it felt there's a several times we we're asking people operating the facility or the owners to, to immediately check after a heavy rain event. And we're not saying what that is. And given 
the incredibly wide variety of heavy rain that we have been receiving in the last five years, that could be six inches in a day, or is it an inch in a day? So I thought somewhere, like I thought early in the definition section, we should figure out what that means so people know when it's triggered. Or we can keep repeating it in those sections. But I, it, it just occurred to me, like I saw different, you know, references and I just thought maybe it would be good to put in the definitions. I think that's a good idea. And I did speak to Erin um, Jacques about this. She didn't, uh, she said that um, for Conservation Commission reviews, what they say is that if there's more than a, tw than a half inch of rain that falls, they require that a site be inspected. Mm -hmm. So sh she didn't even say in a 24 hour period, so more than a half inch of rain. And maybe okay. Stephanie may have a comment about that too, because Stephanie used to be the wetlands administrator. I mean, there should be a time frame associated with it. Yeah. So so Martha, uh, Janet was saying in a 24 hour period, that's fine. I, I can I can but, take that, yep. At least previously, that was a pretty much the time frame was within 24 hours. Okay, so I'll, I'll include that. All right, good. So do we want to go through submittal requirements or is that just two? Um, That's two. <laughs> two, yeah, well, two. Yeah, why don't we just scroll through it slowly? I meant, uh, I had my hand up, but I took it down. Oh yeah, please, sorry, Jack, yep. I'll, I'll read the, those two sections on my own. I, I don't want to hold everybody up, um, so. And you'll send me comments? Correct, yeah. Okay, and they, you're talking about the two sections of definitions and submittal requirements. The, the nexus and the, oh. nexus and the, uh, uh, the one we just talked about. <laughs> definitions, yeah. Nexus and yeah. definitions. Nexus and definitions. I'll read separately. Yeah. Okay, and what about submittal requirements? Do we want to go through those? They're kind of laborious. They are laborious. Uh, yeah. Janet. So I have an add to them. Um, um, I think we need to say a plant and wildlife study, maybe under the first section of existing conditions or separately. And I remember that was done on a project in my neighborhood, unfortunately during November, um, when it'd be hard to figure out what plants and wildlife there, there would be. But I think that, um, you know, it's one thing to say, is there an endangered species or threatened species that's been documented it's another thing to say you have like 50 acres of land and no one's ever looked. And so I think we should put that onto the proponent. I don't think that's uncommon. Um, and I also, when I talked to Scott Jackson about this, you know, cause we were talking about like what's there. And he said, well, you know, generally like if the state is identified, it's there, but it, there might be important species that no one's actually seen. And so you have to kind of go look. So how about if we say that that would be required for um, a project that's over five acres? Because it seems like that's, you know, kind of burdensome for a smaller project. I'm not, I'm actually not sure how burdensome it would be, um, just to go look because you're going to be doing a wetlands delineation anyway, um, and then have someone go out and check the species. I mean, it actually might be easier on a smaller thing than larger. I don't know. I wonder if um, Stephanie might have some insight. I'd also just ask whether that's required for other development, um, and then also. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want if a project is getting going in in November. I wouldn't necessarily. Um, I to, to what extent would it postpone um, the process until if it if it had to be a study that was done during the um, more active uh, growing season or wildlife season. So I, I think so. It has been required before, and I I think that. Um, you know, if it's an endangered species on three acres of land versus 40 acres, it's still an important species. Um, you know, I live near some dwarf wedge mussels. You know, I'm not, you know, sure what piece of, you know, how big the acreage is that, but that's important that they're there and they're they're federally endangered. Um, and also like these solar projects, like we're really doing is notifying people like this is what you need to do to come to us. And we don't want to have a situation where there's like a there's some kind of sparrow that was on the landfill and that stopped everything for I don't know for a long time. And so, it, I think it makes sense to know get all the information you need to know at the beginning, not somewhere in the middle or, you know, relying on someone with a set of binoculars walking around. I just I just think it's a pretty reasonable requirement, and it it was required in my this small project in my neighborhood. All right, uh, Bob. 
Uh, can somebody show me where this is, the part that Janice? She's suggesting that we add it after number one here, where you say existing conditions plan, and then include it somehow in number one or make it another number. Okay, well, as someone who's done wildlife surveys for 40 years, I think this would be impossible. I mean, it's a nice token thing to do, to say you recognize it, but to do a wildlife survey uh, that, um, without requiring years to do it adequately is really kind of pointless. And as far as plants go, um, like the implication was in the wintertime, it could be really difficult. A lot with the wetlands, we do can rely on the soil, so we're not totally dependent on wetland uh, required uh, species requiring wetlands. So I, I would not want to put wildlife in here, especially, and I would question plants. Thanks, Bob. Jack? Um, along those lines, you know, I, I feel like we have the biomap uh, for the core and uh, critical habitat, which is a, a very uh, strong zone that we've eliminated solar that is tends to be contiguous uh, land that is protective of uh, wildlife, presumed wildlife that would be there. Uh, so that's strong. And that, and it didn't, for me, I think the example of the landfill, the old landfill where we should have had solar because of the, the grasshopper sparrow, which has not been spotted in years, there, I think is super unfortunate. So I, I think, you know, some moderation with regard to, you know, what we're protecting and the overall public welfare of the town should be considered when we start talking about, you know, looking super hard for, for wildlife that may or may not actually exist there. So along the lines of Bob or Robert. So just um, to clarify for other projects, someone asked this question. Yeah. We don't require that kind of study unless there's a particular concern about some wildlife or some plant. Um, it is it is not a normal thing to require that kind of study. So I would recommend we do not include that language. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, um, Martha. Yeah, I guess I agree, agree that if we have the what Jack said about we have some uh, discussion of the biomap three already in there and you know some discussion of later of ecosystem services and so on it would seem that that does uh, cover our concerns and and that this uh, you know describing you know how do you, how do you do this careful survey that would take a year or years uh, it does seem uh, you know not too practical all right, I I tend to agree with these comments, and I do see the um, biomap and other things are 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 um, a submission in number twenty five. Uh, uh -huh. but we haven't looked at yet. Uh, okay. So, do we want to go through these submittal requirements then? If I read through them quickly, why why don't you just kind of scroll through them? Yeah, that's, that's... what I would be. Oh, okay. Yeah, just. Okay. So number 25 does talk about natural and endangered species program, okay. estimated and priority habitats, biomap three and critical natural landscape and core habitat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that that kind of covers the, covers it then, the importance of core habitat. Okay, anything else on the um, submittal requirements? I assume that when we discuss battery storage, either this time or next time, there's any submittal requirements related to that would be in, in separately in that section. Is that right? Well, the, um, the bylaw that I sent you yesterday did have... Um, special submittal requirements for battery storage. That right. was the, the where right. bylaw. So we yes. could include what they include yeah. if that's adequate. Um, so on number 30, uh, Bob submitted a uh, comment. Number 30 is a mitigation plan for noise, loss of farmland or agricultural soils, loss of forest, loss of carbon sequestration, 
loss of environmental services, other losses as necessary. And he asked, is this required for any other development of similar impact? And it is not required. Often noise is required if there's a concern about noise. Um, but the other things, well, the other things are not required. So what do you want to do about that one? Well, my understanding is from our last meeting when we discussed this, that we did settle that there would be a mitigation plan. Um, I think we said for 10 acres or, or greater, but we're, there were some subsequent questions about whether everybody would use 9.9 .9 acres, um, uh, but that we would, recognizing that this was a ask or a mitigation requirement that was at this point unique to solar development that we would express our interest uh, and and recognition that this was um, um, unique to, to solar development and that uh, our recommendation would be that the council um, consider applying such mitigation requirements for, for any developments over this acreage um, with the idea that we wouldn't necessarily want to um, um, yeah. incentivize uh, development uh, of of um, other types of development instead of solar uh, because of this mitigation requirement. Okay. Uh, but let's hear, um, I, I didn't catch the order, but Jack, Janet, Martha. Yeah, I'm um, I'm trying to catch up on on the mitigation plan. Is this something that's elaborated further within the bylaws? Yes, it is yeah. Yes. And and what what were we saying about noise? That there's a concern about noise because of some of the equipment um, that apparently oh, produces but, noise in some instances, like the humming. I think humming. Uh -huh. Um, okay, well, I'll just address it, you know, when it uh, shows up, I guess, later in the bylaw. Uh, yeah. Uh, who did I say was next? Yeah. Janet? Muted. Um, so I think there's also a requirement of, like, scenic impacts mitigation. I, I would add that and leave that in, but I think if I was a um a project proponent i wouldn't be clear what would be required of me you know what i mean i mean but actually but it would be it would, it's kind of telling the project proponent you know we want you to mitigate these problems in some way and so i've been reading through the um Shootsbury proposal i'm kind of just beginning to do that and you can see them addressing issues like that so in a way it's a heads up to the proponent this is what we want you to work, look at, work at, it's a heads up to the ZBA who's been begging for more guidance about what are the concerns with solar and what, what needs to be done. So I, I would leave it in um, and just added the scenic impacts too, because that comes up later in the. Um... Yeah, I, I would, let me just add, next? let me just add, even though I'm not next, um, <laughs> that this, this uh, number 30 here seems to be broader than what I had stated before about um, uh, replacing forest land or farmland with with some other land that's in sequestrate or in um, per perpetuity. Um, this also we would want a develop or proponent a, pro a project proponent, for example, to say, okay, I've looked at this parcel and it's a it's a, it, 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 it's farmland or pro or, or good soils, um, agricultural soils, but I purposefully have, are mitigating the. Um, uh, impact on on the good agricultural soils by citing the project over here on the parcel as opposed to um, over the agricultural soils. So that's the kind of um, response that we usually get. Mm -hmm. And then if the board yep. wants more than that, then they ask for more. So I think that's a reasonable response. All right, good. Um, Martha and then Bob. Yeah. I mean, my initial reaction was to think that the, that this statement under number 30 was kind of general and vague. And, you know, we're pretty specific, I think, in the other sections about what we define as mitigation for uh, specific things like forest or farmland or 
uh, and, and so on. So I questioned whether to have that in at all. But Chris, if you're saying that this is kind of uh, typical to make a, this general statement up front in, in a bylaw, um, maybe we could say, you know, refer specific, say that we refer specifically to the following sections to explain them or something. Uh, you know, so I'm, it's, it seems a little bit too general to me to be, to be very clear. Uh, but some of these are going to be important as we go through the rest of the bylaw. I think some of them are important and some of them are not applicable, depending on what kind of situation you're in. So this is saying to the applicant, we want this information. If you think it's not applicable or if you think you've already compensated for it or mitigated for it, tell us about that. And then it's up to the board to decide, has the applicant given us enough information so that we can make a decision or not? But the fact that it's in here means that the board expects some somehow that the applicant address the, this issue, whichever one of it or two of it or three is applicable. Okay. Okay, Bob. Um, yeah, maybe I guess after what Chris just says, maybe I'm not as opposed, but I how do you write a mitigation plan for the loss of environmental services? I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> as a professionally environmentalist, I don't know what that means. It's just like um, Martha said, it's just too vague. I can't, why are we going to require something that no one knows how to do? Well, Dwayne did define environmental services for us, and we have a paragraph about it or two later on in the in the text here. Yeah, and so, it's, it's not that they have to eliminate these impacts they have to mitigate them to, to 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 a reasonable extent i think the the idea is that it um assures and requires that the proponent has given these some due diligent thought um to how to mitigate and then is a and then the town is able to engage in a conversation on these issues with the applicant uh to understand um what they are proposing in terms of these issues and then have some uh, um, back and forth on, on trying to make sure that they mitigate it to a re to a reasonable extent. You could change the word loss to impact, a mitigation for impact to these various things. And that would be similar to mm -hmm. a mini um, environmental impact report. And then um, the applicant would you know, write a paragraph or a page or whatever about each of these things about why it didn't apply or why it did apply and here's how we're dealing with it. So maybe we should change the word loss to impact because we don't necessarily have in a loss in, in all each of these of the, cases. In each yeah. of the bullets? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Right. makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Jack? Yeah, I, I suggest uh, environmental services totally throws me off i mean because that's i'm a consultant uh can we say like something like ecosystem functions or something that is not so broadly used for <laughs> for things um i see environmental uh, ecosystem services later on the report uh, but can we use something other than services like functions or processes ecosystem processes is that apparently environmental services? Oh, ecosystem services in the definitions. I see. Yeah, but, I think that's better. This, um, that's a you know human activity. <laughs> Broadly speaking, it, it definitely throws me. So, what are you suggesting, Jack? That we substitute <laughs> ecosystem service or ecosystem function? Yeah, ecosystem processes or ecosystem functions or something like that. If Duane agrees, because that, that um... So I was gonna suggest just putting ecosystem services and I think we should mull this because um, I understand what Jack's saying, but I'm not sure it actually makes it more narrow to say ecosystem functions versus services, but I, I, I see his point. Processes. I mean, the thing is, there's just so many, and you know, and that's actually 
sort of inside the ecosystem services too. I don't know. Let's just, maybe we should just put it there and just mull it for our next meeting. Yep. Okay. Let's do that and move, move forward. Okay. But Bob, did, is that a new hand? Yeah. But just real quickly, I, to me, this is just uh, an opportunity for a lawyer to sue, to stop something because this mitigation plan is inadequate to uh, accommodate for the loss of, and then you pick your poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a legitimate concern. If it if it makes Bob feel any better, it's really hard to sue on these things. <laughs> <laughs> really hard. It's not hard to sue. It's hard to. It's almost. It's very difficult to win. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it, but it's a process. The first part is right. <laughs> Yeah. But it's also very expensive to sue too. That's another problem too. So ecosystem services versus okay. Let's. I think I think if we say impact instead of loss, that that would that helps because then it's harder to sue. I should think. I don't know. I don't know if it really makes a difference. I mean, <laughs> I like the idea of like you're losing farmland and soils. That's a that's kind of more of a picture in your head. But I, you know, impacts is kind of a little more general, I guess. I'm not, I'm not going to die on that sword, though. I have to go yell at my dog. Okay, let's. Shall uh, we proceed? Yeah, let's proceed and, and maybe put this section in yellow or something to um, come back to. Go back to design standards, access roads, roads, and public access. Access roads shall be planned and constructed in consultation with the town engineer fire department and department of public works and shall be planned and constructed to minimize grading stormwater runoff removal of stone walls and trees and to minimize impact to natural and cultural or cultural resources at the discretion of the pga permit granting authority roads should be curved to the extent possible to limit direct views into the project especially from scenic roads and to slow down stormwater runoff so as to limit or prevent erosion. And Martha had a comment that she thought those two things should be reversed in order, that erosion was more important than, or more of a concern, I guess, than impact to scenic. So I would say limit to, to and instead of um, having to limit direct views into the pro project, we would have to slow down stormwater runoff so as to limit or prevent erosion, and then we would say, and to limit direct views into the project, especially from scenic roads, okay? Yep. All right. The applicant shall be required to repair damage to public roads that result from construction. The existing farm roads shall be maintained in a stable condition. Existing public access to trails shall be maintained or the applicant shall reroute the trails with approval from the permit granting authority. Now, some of these, I'm not sure about this one because um, some of these trails are not really public trails. They're trails across private property and the landowner has granted the public access, but the landowner can take back that grant of public access. So, um, I don't know if we should say shall be or are encouraged to be maintained. Um, I know for a fact that Coles Lumber has a lot of trails across their property that they're happy and willing to let the public um, go across, but they have every right to stop that access if they want to. So how about saying shall be encouraged to be maintained? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, Janet. Um, this is a sticky wicket um, legally because when you say public access, you know, it's sort of, you know, I, I understand what you're saying about, because I know that there was a Coles solar array and it cut off a trail. And so they did reread it around the array, you know, which is, and, but there's a, the sticky wicket to me is the word existing public access. So there's a whole series of cases that go back to like, the time of um, medieval kings that um, in English common law about rights of public access and on trails. And so I wonder, I understand what you're saying, but I wonder, I'd like to ponder a way to say, to protect 
a public right of access versus public access, if that makes sense. I, I'd like to brood on that a little bit. So um, you'll come back with him, uh, wording? Yeah. Okay. Okay, lighting. Lighting of LGPIs shall be consistent with local, state, and federal law. Lighting of other parts of the installation, such as appurtenant structures, shall be limited to that required for safety and operational purposes, and shall be reasonably shielded from abutting properties. Lighting of these installations shall be directed downwards and shall incorporate full cutoff fi fixtures to reduce light pollution unless otherwise approved by the PGA. Lighting of these installations shall be limited to nighttime maintenance and inspections by authorized personnel. Lighting controls shall be available to emergency personnel to turn on at their discretion during an emergency. All lighting shall comply with International Dark Sky Standard, fi standard Fixture Seal of Approval certification requirements. There shall be no illumination when personnel are not on the site. Okay. Um, sign, signage. Signs on LGPIs shall comply with the Town of Amherst Zoning Bylaw Article 8. A sign consistent with the Town of Amherst Zoning Bylaw Article 8 shall be required to identify the owner and provide a 24-hour emergency contact phone number of the installation owner or operator. LGPIs shall not be used for displaying any advertising except for reasonable identification of the manufacturer or operator of the solar photovoltaic installation. Maybe we could take out the word solar there. In addition to identification signs, the PGA shall permit signs for safety, such as no trespassing signs and signs required to warn of danger. Emergency signage for battery energy storage facilities associated with LGPIs, including signs for emergency shutoff procedures and signs related to fire management and fire suppression shall be required. At the discretion of the PGA, exceptions may also be made for educational signs that provide information about the project. The PGA shall determine the appropriate size material, materials and placement of such educational signs. To the extent possible, signs should be grouped together to reduce sign clutter. Any comments? Janet has her hand up. Yeah, I, would, I think that's an old one, but. I'm sorry, that is old. Yep, yeah, okay. Okay. Utility connections. Where technically and economically feasible, reasonable efforts as determined by the PGA shall be made to place all utility connections from the solar, uh, from the photovoltaic installation underground, um, depending on appropriate soil conditions, shape, and topography of the site, and any requirements of the utility provider. Uh, that is not usually a problem. We haven't run into any issues with that. Um, glare. Solar panels, to the extent feasible, shall be positioned and screened so as not to create glare and minimize glare on surrounding occupied structures and roadways. <clears throat> the LGPI shall be positioned to minimize glare on any residence or public way. The applicant should submit ratings and technical specifications for the solar panels to ensure minimal reflectivity. The design of the installation shall prevent reflected solar radiation or glare from becoming a public nuisance or hazard to adjacent buildings, roadways, or properties. Design efforts may include, but not be limited to, deliberate placement and arrangement on the site, anti-reflective materials, solar glare modeling, and screening in addition to required landscaping. Okay? Okay, visual impact. A visual impact assessment shall be conducted that follows established protocols. Such assessment is preferred to include the following. A design narrative, a narrative that describes how the project has been configured or located and how it avoids or minimizes visual impacts. Maps and documentation of the analysis conducted shall accompany the narrative and be used to generally describe the anticipated visibility of the project. The narrative should provide details concerning alternative configurations or sites that were evaluated in the design process and the design mitigation strategies employed to reduce any visual impact to sensitive resources. Two, inventory. An inventory and description of the cultural and scenic resources located within the 
the viewshed of the proposed activity, including historic structures and historic districts, scenic roads, cultural landscapes and vistas, open areas that are visible from public roads, and recreational areas. Information on these resources may be found by searching MACRIS and by reviewing the Town of Amherst's Master Plan, Open Space and Recreation Plan, Historic Preservation Plan, and other local plans. Three, visualization and simula simulation. With input from the PGA, the applicant shall utilize tools such as photo simulations or viewshed analyses through renderings, line of sight studies, and or two or three dimensional visualizations such as photo montage, video montage, animation produced through spatial information systems and geographic information systems to assess the visual impacts and describe the anticipated effect of the proposed project on the region's scenic and cultural resources. The number of simulations required will depend on the anticipated impact and the sensitivity of the resources present. The visual impact assessment should include consideration of all parts of the project, including all associated infrastructure. In the event more than one alternative is being considered, the visual impact of all alternatives should be evaluated by the applicant. The assessment should map locations along local public ways where the solar installation is visible above the visual horizon and anticipate locations such as high elevation points or across water bodies where distant views are possible. Confer with Town of Amherst staff to identify points of view of particular interest or concern to be documented at the time of visual impact assessment. Visual mitigation. Propose mitigation measures as applicable. Mitigation may include careful sighting, sighting away from scenic resources and key view sheds, curval and ear access roads, and screening. Any questions or comments on that? Yeah, uh, Janet. So Chris, I, I can intuit from this what the design standard is, but I'm not sure if I was the ZBA or the planning board, I would know what the rule is. Like what's the standard? Cause you're, you're sort of saying, it's like all these different things are saying, you know, it's, you know, minimize impacts or move your project away or cover up, but it doesn't sort of say um, the applicant shall, you know, carefully cite its solar array as to, you know, avoid impact, negative impacts on scenic views and resources uh, or, you know, or, and, and, as an alternative, mitigate as much as possible or something. So I, I feel like the design standard itself kind of, it's implied, but it's not said. Well, I think that's up to the board to decide whether the impact to a particular thing or area is significant enough, and then they can work with the applicant to, um, to develop a, a mitigation. I don't think that we need to be, you know, detailed in the uh, description of what those mitigations might be. I think this is this is actually pretty broad and pretty well written, in my opinion. When I first saw it, I was worried that it was too strict, but having read through it several times, I think it's reasonable. And um, you know, people who are doing these large-scale uh, solar installations are working with um, designers and engineers who do impacts uh, impact assessments all the time, visual impact assessments. So they know what to do and they know how to um, compensate for problems. And in all cases, we're not gonna be able to solve the problem, but in many cases we will be. So it's really a kind of back and forth, um, back and forth process. It's not a definitive process that this is what you have to do when you confront this situation. It's more like, well, here's a problem with what is being impacted visually, how are we going to solve that problem? And the board and the applicant work together. So I really don't think you need more than what's described here, but maybe others do. Did you any thoughts on that, but we'll go to Martha. Yeah, well, I mean, my naive reading was that the whole thing seemed like a lot, like kind of overkill, but I think, Chris, you've just explained that this is sort of a more or less standard then. It's not <clears throat> really ex something excessive then for a developer to do. I don't think it's excessive. And we do have similar um, requirements for, um, what do you call them? 
wireless telecommunication devices. You know, when someone wants to come in and put a big pole somewhere, um, we require them to do visual studies. Now, they're not going to be able to hide something that's 180 feet tall, but they can place it in a way that makes it not as obtrusive from ground level, or they can screen it. You know, there, there are things that can be done to mitigate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't think it's, uh, you know, out of whack or excessive, although maybe Laura will have other thoughts about that when she has an opportunity to, uh, you know, comment. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're comfortable with it, then I, I think that that's fine. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I might send you a sentence that sort of captures that. I'll, I'll look at the wireless one because I think what's good about this is it really outlines like the way to do it and look at it and to like look at options and things like that. But I, I'm not sure the board would understand its power to say, you know, I, I was one sentence I was thinking the project shall avoid um, significant ne negative impacts on X, Y, and Z and, you know, whatever, you know, avoid and mitigate significant negative impacts on X, Y, and Z. It might just be as simple as that. And then this whole section is sort of saying how you do it. And I'll, but I'll, I could just send that in and then desperately look around for this um, wireless thing on page 34, which I don't seem to have in my thing. You don't have it in your bylaw, huh? I, oh, I think, oh, I see it. It's in the, it's in the use chart. So um, I just like to, I'll, I could send that around maybe later to talk about, it, but I just don't, I'm not sure the board would understand its power or what it's able to say yay or nay to, or what it's looking to achieve, but it's implied in everything you've said. So I have mixed feelings. All right, good. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Chris, just one, I think in the, the paragraph before the four, uh, the confer, um, I'm not sure if that's a sentence, sentence. Um, so it might be just the- Oh, shall, shall confer. confer. Yeah. Applicant shall confer, yeah. Okay. Uh, fencing. There shall be a fence built surrounding the solar array and ancillary array equipment. The fence shall be knuckled, selvage, chain link fence, unless determined otherwise by the PGA. The bottom of the fence shall be at least six to eight inches above the ground to allow for wildlife crossing under the fence. Fencing shall not include barbed wire. It is acknowledged that appropriate measures shall be taken to prevent the solar array from being damaged or tampered with by individuals trying to access the area of the installation. The method of securing the site shall be subject to the approval of the PGA. The need for fencing shall be determined by the applicant unless such fencing is needed to comply with town bylaws and or as required per National Electric Code. Now we have um, had Fred Hartwell, who's a member of the planning board, has questioned this reference to the National Electric Code. So I need to um, confirm which reference we should have here. And some of this may be redundant. Um, I think, you know, we're saying it shall be, there shall be a fence. And then we're saying the need for a fence shall be determined by the applicant. So I think there should be a fence. I don't think we should let it be determined by the applicant. What do you all think? I, I would like to hear what Laura would have to say about whether um, solar projects generally always have fencing uh, and whether the solar developers actually want fencing. <laughs> Um, but, um, so I'd be curious to know if there's sort of exam reasons why there wouldn't be fencing. Yeah, I would think that it would be important to, um, protect the equipment, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then what, uh, if installed such fancy, such fencing shall be no more than eight feet tall unless otherwise permitted by the PGA. The fence shall be consistent with the character of surrounding properties set back from roadway frontage and public areas and screened by vegetation. Okay. Screening and planting. Should I keep going? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The LGPI shall be designed to minimize its visibility, including preserving natural vegetation to the maximum extent possible adding vegetative buffers and or fencing to provide an effective visual barrier from adjacent roads and driveways and from abutting dwellings. 
The installation shall be screened year round from public and private ways and from adjacent residential lots to the extent that is feasible. The PGA may alter or waive this requirement if such screening would have a detrimental impact on the design, operation, or performance of the array. The PGA may consider the provision of screening and buffers when reviewing the proposed LGPI to protect scenic vistas and view sheds and to protect views from residential uses, public streets, and any waterways or water bodies. Where existing vegetation in the setbacks is insufficient to achieve year-round screening, additional screening shall be provided, including but not limited to planting of dense vegetative screening, fencing, berms, use of natural ground elevations, and or land contouring, all depending on specific site-specific conditions. Tree cutting within the required setback area shall not be permitted if it would reduce to any degree the effectiveness of the year-round screening. However, if there are trees within the screening area that cast shade on the solar panels, they may be removed. If additional plantings are required for screening, a planting plan shall be submitted to the PGA showing the types, sizes, and locations of material to be used using a diversity of plant species native, native to New England and shall be subject to the approval of the PGA. Plantings shall include a variety of native trees and shrubs of varying heights staggered to effectively screen the installation from view during construction and operations. The depth of the vegetative screening shall be a minimum of 50 feet unless otherwise approved by the PGA. At least 75% of the planting shall consist of evergreens and shall be evenly spaced throughout the setback area. Additional planting should include native plants to provide food, pollen, and or shelter for native wildlife and or follow a food forest model, integrating trees, shrubs, perennial plants, and, and ground covers to mimic a native woodland that creates habitat for local wildlife and provides food for humans and wildlife. Someone questioned about the food forest and the providing of food for humans. I think that's sort of a suggestion. Um, it should include these things, but I don't think if this screening didn't include food for humans, I don't think the PGA would be uh, objecting to that. Would it so, be permissible to produce food for humans? I mean, if it's not a farm, I mean, who's... Yeah, I don't, I don't remember who suggested that. I think it might have been uh, Janet who um, asked to have this language put in here, um, and I can't remember who objected to it. So, right. well, let's finish this section, then we'll. Uh, I know Janet's had her hand up, but let's mm -hmm. finish this section. Yeah. This okay. Section. Use of invasive plants, as identified by the most recent version of the Massachusetts prohibited plant list maintained by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, is prohibited. Cultivars of native plants may be acceptable if sourcing of native species is not possible. Applicants shall install plantings within the array, include, including native species and pollinator-friendly species, and species that are supportive of wildlife, rather than installing non-vegetative materials such as stone mulch, unless otherwise permitted by the PGA, or unless the project is operated as an agrivoltaic voltaics project, in which case the plant materials shall be appropriate to the agricultural purposes. Planting of the vegetative screening shall be completed prior to the connection of the installation. Plants shall be maintained and replaced if unhealthy by the owner operator of the installation for the life of the installation. Okay, that's a lot to talk about. All right, uh, very good. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, Janet? Um, actually, that is a lot to talk about. So working backwards, I don't remember the food forest model idea, but I remember saying it'd be nice if that um, the plantings could be have food for that can be shelter and habitat and food for um, the, the wildlife. Yeah. Um, I I wonder if fifty feet is too big because when I was looking at other local towns, it was thirty feet. Um, I mean, it seems like a thirty foot, you know, evergreen barrier at, that actually does screen it is seems this efficient. I wonder if we're just taking up too much space, but I, I so that's one, another comment. Um, and then what I really, um, that popped out of me is in the second paragraph um, when it's requiring, um, you know, being screened year round from public or private ways um, from adjacent lots to extent feasible. 
So the next sentence kind of popped out at me as being like too broad and too vague and sort of a, too much of a, um, a, a kind of an out. The PGA may alter or waive this requirement if such screening would have a detrimental impact on the design operation and or performance of the array. And that phrase, a detrimental impact, I don't know, it just seems to like anybody could say, well, this, you know, this requirement of screening is having a detrimental impact on my design because I'm not able to get the panels where I want to or as many as I want to or as much energy as I want to from them. So I think it, that has to be kind of narrowed more or, um, you know, it's just it's just too wide of an exception. And it's like, it's too vague, a detrimental impact, like a significant impact or something to kind of make it a little more narrow. Significant detrimental impact? Kind of better. Um, I don't I don't know, it doesn't, it, I, I just worried about it being too much of an exception, but at least significant or I don't know, that'd be better. You don't want to tie people up into knots, but you don't want to like have the rope so loose. There is no real incentive to, you know, anyone could say, oh, this is having a digital impact on performance because I have to screen instead of putting more panels in. And I think the screening and the planting is important because it helps public buy-in. Like that's one thing that people are, you know, don't like about it. Um, and it's sort of, we're trying to take that away. But I also think that I'm thinking the 50 foot, you know, vegetative screen might be too thick or unnecessary. Okay. Even Shootsbury had 30 feet and they were, they were trying to buffer, make sure the forest areas still look forested. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Martha has a comment on that. Yeah, just to follow up what Janet was questioning about the we 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 have somewhere a rule about setbacks, right? We have we say you know fifty feet setback or a hundred feet from a from a scenic road. So there's already the setback, and so I guess the qu Janet's question is how much of that setback has to be devoted to screening? Do you have to plant the shrubs and evergreens all the way or, or not? And so I guess I would join with, with questioning whether you had to have, you know, the screening, you know, of shrubs be, you know, quite that extensive. All you need is uh, enough to be an effective screen, as long as you've got the setback. So do we want to make a, a change here to say that the screen should be 30 feet instead of 50 feet? As long as that doesn't override the setback requirement. No, you'd still need the setback. That. Yeah, I would support that. Um, are there any um, anybody who would not be in favor of that change. All right, thanks. Yeah, let's do that. Anything else on this section? No. Okay. Um, slope and soils. All LGPIs shall not be installed on slopes greater than fifteen percent. Which means three feet and twenty feet. That's just sort of for the layman to understand. Um, all soils must be kept on site. Control of vegetation, synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers may not be used to control vegetation or animals except as otherwise approved by the PGA. The reason this is here is because sometimes you need to use an a, an herbicide pesticide to get rid of the material that's there already so you can plant the pollinator habitat. And I think that um, the state recognizes that. Now, whether synthetic um, material should be allowed or whether it has to be, you know, natural, um, organic, I, I don't know enough about this to understand this. I think I did get some comment from Scott Cashin about it. So, um, He's in the audience. Maybe he has something to say about that. But um, anyway, okay, moving on. And let uh, me just uh, on this, uh, Martha. Yeah, I did a question about the statement: all soils must be kept on site. 
think somewhere we elaborate a little more. I mean, there's a difference uh, or, or whether we also need to say anything about soils not being imported without PGA approval or. I think we said something about that later on, but later I on. will check it out. It's not yeah. imported. Okay. Just flag it for checking then. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, Janet. Yep. Um, I had this thing in the back of my head that Jonathan Murray said that we can't regulate pesticide use because it's been preempted by the state act. And I kind of looked through my memos on him and I know maybe he said that during the presentation, but I think we need to double check that because this issue comes up a bunch of times. Um, and so there's this issue in the law, like where there's, if the state or the federal government have covered so many aspects of an issue, they effectively preempt it, but sometimes they just say we're preempting it. And so I think he should have the answer to that. It just kept on, it just, I have this memory of this. Can you find out from him? Who said that? Jonathan Murray, I think said. Oh, I would have to find out from him then. Yeah. I thought you said Jonathan Thompson, I'm sorry. There's a lot of Jonathan's floating around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Dual use. The PGA shall look positively or favorably on solar installations that include agrivoltaic or dual use. Um, okay. Let's. Let, let me um, pause here for a second because I, I want to note the time. We have 25 minutes left. Um, and I do want to allow for the public um, to have any comments uh, for 10 minutes. Um, and so I'm wondering, we're, we, we're sort of entering the special sections, um, forest, and then I think farms after that. There is going to be a section here on storage as well. Uh, do we want to um, just continue running through? Uh, and uh, Or the, the bigger area that we haven't really fully discussed yet is storage um that we do now have a, a model if you will from where it was aware sorry or palmer it's oh. where yes okay where yep um um that we could uh i looked at it quickly and i didn't really have any time to digest it fully uh we could discuss our over overarching ideas uh and then leave it to chris to draft something for our review on next week on Tuesday. Um, or we could um, just ask Chris to take, use her best um, thoughts um, and expertise to to um, work with the where language and provide us with something to review on Tuesday. Um, is there any sense from the group uh, in terms of whether we want to have a discussion on storage first or wait for the drafting next time Martha yeah I had uh, sent to to Chris a few days ago um, my proposals thoughts for that section I read the where document the Shutesbury document and the um, national uh, fire protection document, what is it, 855 or something that has all the specifics in it and sort of made a, a list of requirements. I, but I, I think I'd suggest that unless we have anything burning, that we should just wait until next week to run through it, because it seems like it's efficient for, it makes efficient sense for us to run through a, a draft that um, Chris yep. has put together. Okay. I could send mine to Stephanie if you, if you wanted to look at it now. Yes, I will. Um, I'll find that email that you sent me, Martha. Thank you, and I will um try to incorporate those comments along with the where. I wanted to suggest, along with um public comment, that we might want to look at that chart that I made up yeah. of um yeah. the requirements for the permit type. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's uh. Yep, that was on my list as well. So good. Um, why don't we turn after we hear from Jack and Janet, if that's a new hand, 
Um, why don't we turn to that, Chris? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the um, War uh, Supply Protection Committee, uh, we, we spent as much time on the battery storage as we did in the solar. So I encourage everybody on the in the group to revisit the white paper. Yeah. Yeah, good. All right, good. Um, Janet, is that a new one or? A... It is new. I, I'm not sure. I mean, it seems like we have a lot, you know, as you know, we've gone over those earlier sections many times and we have small edits and I'm concerned that the there's more, we're getting to like the heavy issues that we, that, you know, it's just, it's a lot of it is new drafting and we haven't really made decisions on. And it's hard for me to see like that we could read one draft of a best a battery storage thing and say, oh, that's fine for by the next meeting. So I just, I'm not sure. I'm not dis. I, I have nothing to say about the where thing or not having not looked at it, but it just seems kind of rushed to me. And I'd rather really focus on a really strong solar bylaw, and maybe defer the best to a different group or a different process. I'm not sure. I'm, I could sit there and say, "Oh, I read one bylaw and I think it looks good." Well, let's. Um, what I would suggest is that we, um, if Chris can try to get us a draft which she has generally a, a few days ahead of time which would be almost like towards the end of this week if at all possible uh that we come with um with that reviewed pretty carefully uh so that we can um try to be reach some comfort level uh with the draft um on on our last day on tuesday okay uh, great. Thanks, Chris. Do you want to, um, Jack, go ahead. I've always wondered, uh, is my, am I looking really, really, uh, red in my video? <laughs> yes, you do. Okay. You look like you're under. <laughs> I'm not on fire. I just want to say I'm not on fire. <laughs> <laughs> beyond Trumpy and orange right now. <laughs> yeah, right. You've got to work on your bronzing a little bit. <laughs> okay. oh, that's better. Okay. We need to have the um, chart queued up. That'd be great. Okay. And um, Chris, maybe you can put sort of the context of this for those that are not as familiar with this permitting and, and how this fits in with zoning uh, and then, and then go through your suggestion here. Yeah. So currently um, our, zoning bylaw <laughs> regulates um, solar development under a section that's called um, energy generation and something else. And it's pretty much special permit all the way across the board. And we have been regulating uh, solar installations by special permit, and we've had pretty good luck with it. The only one that I remember that was um, reviewed by site plan review was the one at Hampshire College. And the one at Hampshire College was an accessory use to Hampshire College. And accessory uses are governed by the uh, principal use. So the principal use of Hampshire College, if it were not in the ED zoning district, since it's an educational use, would be allowed by site plan review. So that solar installation was allowed by site plan review. But all the other ones, the one on the landfill and the one up on I think it's Sunderland Road, and there's another one, I think, that exists on Pulpit Hill Road. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, those have all been by special permit, and there haven't really been any issues with those. And I think the review process has been good. And so um, I would recommend that we continue to require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals for large-scale ground-mounted solar installations just because it's it's worked really well. But if we wanted to potentially encourage it to go in a certain location, you know, um, rather than other locations, we could consider the Professional Research Park, which is, um, it is a zoning district in three different locations. And I'm sorry, I don't have the ability to bring the maps up and maybe I will try to do that next time. But um, the three locations are where on Route 9, where Green Leaves is located, 
and where the new um, building, Aspen Heights, that's an apartment building, is located, that is all Professional Research Park. And the original idea of pro Professional Research Park was that it would be um, an economic development generator, and people would want to put you know, office buildings and maybe some small manufacturing and things like that, similar to the industrial park over in Northampton, but maybe not having a, as heavy industry as they have. Um, but it hasn't really worked that way. So the one, uh, the PRP on Route 9 is mostly housing right now. It's Green Leaves and it's Aspen Heights. Um, the one on um, Belchertown Road, it's a very large PRP zoning district, and it has um, the old Stavros building, and it has uh, that yellow farmhouse that's right on Route 9, and it has Ron Laverdier's development of uh, Atkins, Atkinson, you know, Kate Atkinson's um, medical practice, and then there's another one, Hart and Patterson Financial Group, and there's a small, uh, oh, and um, what used to be, what is it now, SPGA or something like that. Anyway, there's an environmental company there. It used to be Northeast Envir Environmental Consultants. So some of that land has been used for its, you know, its purpose, the environmental consultants um, and Hart and Patterson. But there are pretty big areas there that haven't been used for anything. So I guess what I'm saying is, PRP hasn't been as successful being used for what it was intended to be used for. So why don't we think about using the PRP as a place where we might like large-scale solar to go, and therefore we might approve it by site plan review rather than special permit. So that's all I have to say here. So these could all be by special permit, which would be fine with me, but if we wanted to look at a place where we think solar would be pretty good, then it might be the PRP zoning district. So I don't know if people have anything to say about that. Mm -hmm. And next time I will bring, bring maps. I do have that map available if you want me to share the screen. Matt. That would be helpful. Um. Yep, so I think the three areas, Chris, you were referring to is in, in North Amherst, this area right here. Yes, that's right. It's that uh, yeah. olive color area yep. up there. Yeah. And then we and have then the one along Belchertown Road along here. Belchertown Road, yes. And, and then, then there's one by, along Route 9 by Greenleaves, yes. So those three areas. Yeah. Now, yeah. obviously, where Greenleaves is, there's no more land available except a very small piece, so we're not really talking about that. Um the PRP in North Amherst actually does have quite a lot of land available. And one of the parcels was um, going to be developed for, I don't know if you remember that, um, gosh, what was it called? It was, yeah, it was sort of an academic. The eruptor, professional. right? Yeah. It was the yeah. eruptor, yes. So yeah. that was that didn't happen, yeah. but that you know where that is. And then the other one is down on Belchertown Road where Kate Atkinson is, but there is um, also you know more land available. There's a lot of wetland there, and some of it is owned by the town. Some of it is the old landfill. But there is also vacant land available that could be used for something. So th that was just a suggestion. Um, and then everywhere else, I think it should be by special permit. And um, obviously, we know that there are a lot of constraints based on the map that we had produced by GZA. So solar developers aren't going to want to put solar everywhere else because either it's been already developed or it's APR land or it's conservation land um, or it's not appropriately sized. So what do people think? I agree. Yeah, go ahead, Jen, and then I do want to move the, the public. So part of it, you know, part of it, it seems like the two other PRPs, it's not going to have, we can't put stuff there unless people are taking down buildings. I think the problem with the North Amherst site is it's a lot of it is flood prone, prone conservancy. A lot of it is farmland. There's like the brooks go through it. And I think it's probably a very, that's like a really sensitive area that you'd want to do some special concern for siting. I think Hickory Ridge shows the pitfalls of putting things in flood, flood flooding areas and um you know maybe if we had to do that again i don't think 
those decisions or the, the permit would look the way it does now. Um, and so I don't know, you know, I, I think that, I mean, partly I think there'd be neighborhood op opposition to it, but I also think this is a pretty sensitive area that wouldn't be so, you wouldn't want to have looser requirements. The other thing is I think we need to have looser requirements somewhere. And so I, I think actually I've sort of talked myself into that the educational districts, we have, you know, we, we aren't required, you know, there's the, the college, the colleges have a lot of open land on their, um, and the university have, you know, open land. Um, the university does its own thing because it's state land, but the other, the two colleges have open land that they could put large scale arrays on and we have no permitting requirements on them. And so if we needed a rationale for saying, Hey, we're not putting special permit anywhere, but we always have the ED districts where we just sort of let the schools do what they want. So I'm, I'm not I'm not super in favor of the North Amherst location. I think it will get opposition, but I also think it's a really sensitive area that we'd want to think about how to put a raise in. Well, I would say that I would be comfortable with special permit across the board. So I'm not promoting site plan review. I'm just offering it as a possibility if somebody thought that it we need one place where it can go by right. So I sort of talked myself out of that position because I was because <laughs> I thought the ED districts are wide open. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I would tend to agree that, uh, you know, leave it as the site plan uh, re review, you know, the special permits uh, everywhere, except the, that the EDU district does cover a lot of land area in Amherst. And I think as long as it's clear in the legal sense that here's all this land area that we are allowing uh, solar panels, if the, you know, it's, Amherst and, and Hampshire College are private landowners, just like everyone else. And so if we're saying that that would be, you know, by right or, or you know, open and so on, I think we're, we're doing our part to make uh, some land available without special permit. Okay. All right, good. Um, all right, so do you feel like you have some feedback on that, Chris? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Yep. Okay, so that tees us up for next time to really uh, come prepared, provide edits ahead of time if possible, uh, but uh, for discussion, um, uh, but to get through the remainder of the um, of the uh, of the bylaw, we'll have three hours. Uh, okay, so let me um, ask Stephanie to open it up for any comments from the public. Sure. So if anyone from the public would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and I will unmute you and allow you to speak. Uh, Steve Roof, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi there. Um, thank you. I had a question about the topic just discussed about the educational ed, educational land. Hampshire College has a PV array designed to produce 100% of its electricity needs for the core campus. Um, and that was permitted as part of the educational use. If we were to try to build more, Hampshire would not be using the electricity. Somebody else would be using it. Would that still fall under the educational use and therefore fall under the um, the, the less restrictive permitting process? That is a question for the building commissioner. Um, if somehow you could tie it to the life of Hampshire College, in other words, the financial stability of Hampshire College needed to, you know, have an energy producing property, you might be able to convince him that it was an accessory use. But, um, you know, so that's the, that's the link between Hampshire College and the solar array, that it has to be an accessory use that's supportive of the mission of Hampshire College. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Okay, great. And I think uh, Janet had a, had. A, can, I, can I say two things? A Steve, legal I, review on that. Yeah. I think we'd be taxed on that federally and possibly by the state because it's not you know you're just selling energy, right? You're not doing anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I, I I this is a totally sort of related thing is I I noticed a battery storage system. I think on your educational land right by the Eric Carl and the array, but it was really close to trees. And so I, I began to wonder if we might want to do. Land. You muted yourself. Okay. Whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just thought we might, when we're looking at battery storage, maybe saying in the ED, we do want to make sure it's not near buildings or trees and things like that. 
That's all. Yeah. Yeah, the batteries are not near trees. They're well inside the center of each of the array. In the array. It's hundreds of feet to trees from the battery. Yeah, I don't know what I was looking at then, so I'll, I'll have to correct myself. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, Martha. Yes, I mean, I think in, in answer to, to Steve a little bit, let, let me just say, I think it would be really cool if Steve, you and Dwayne uh, teamed up together and made uh, like a special agrivoltaics uh, study on your open land. It would be great for the students, both uh, at Hampshire College that could could study it. And it, it would be great for UMass's research if you can get data and so on. All you have to do is flip a coin and decide which one of you has to be the one to write the proposal for financing it. Uh, but it seems to me that that could be, you know, something something positive that would that would make a contribution and still could be called an educational use that that would fit the the definition. So, uh, I'd love to see that. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. Okay, any other comments from the attendees? We do have nine in attendance. Lenore Brick, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Guys, really, this is like have been a, a witnessing this steadfast commitment and endurance and attention to detail during this whole process has been amazing. Um, but well, what I've seen, I have a, a couple of questions um, with regard to being in sync with the current and and let's name evolving state climate goals and plans, as you mentioned, the Resil Resilient Lands Initiatives and others. Um, I think it's also important to include, things are, are changing like quickly and dramatically on the state level. In the executive office, the EEA with climate chief, Melissa Hoffer, who's meeting with people all over the state around these solar siting issues and how to protect natural resources at the same time with um, at the state house, because there's a lot of new legislation that's being um, presented and being heard right now. Um, so some of my question is what happens um, if and when state laws and state policy changes, because you said at the beginning, you know, to be, this includes that, or you have to be in sync with that. Um, for example, the exemption, the solar exemption in the Dover Amendment is being challenged right now across the state. Um, and so like, what if that changes? Like, what if um, as, as the studies are coming out, the Dewar study, the, the study that just came out between Mass Audubon and Harvard Forest, the report that was just presented that basically concludes similarly with the Dewar study that there's no good reason to put solar installations on any green land, on forest land or farmland that we have more than enough built and disturbed landscape throughout Massachusetts to meet our goals. What, what happens then as the state is changing right now really quickly and you're putting this draft bylaw together and then it's there? I don't, I don't really know how that works. I have that question then I have two comments. Appreciate that, Lenore. And I'm not sure if we have all the answers. I think just all, from my perspective, the two things, I guess, one is town bylaws are amendable <laughs> as, mm -hmm. as, as circumstances change. So this is not um, necessarily um, committed, committing the town to a, a certain bylaw um, in perpetuity at all. Um, I think the other thing that I'm kind of looking forward to is, is um, the state policy being an, an incentive structure associated with solar uh, to really help direct the market to where we want solar on the built environment and so forth by providing the incentives necessary to move the markets there despite the additional barriers. Um, and so to, to the extent that there is sufficient resources of build, build the built environment, um, the to get the market to go there, uh, is going to uh, need the market incentives to to make that attractive uh, to developers, uh, and and I think that's where I suspect the state is looking at uh, in terms of of uh, looking at the incentive structure to try to get more 
and I would not say all, but more of the um, solar development on the built environment uh, where there's challenges and extra costs uh, and looking at uh, obviously this from an equity lens as well in terms of um, the extra cost associated with putting it on the built environment and the impacts on um, all of our rates um, and and uh, and low income in particular. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Duane, about and and that's and and of course the reps and everybody are looking at that right the incentive structure for the market to go there. Totally, totally, you know. But also we the the math is tricky. I mean, Jonathan Thompson gave that um, presentation at at the Solar Forum. Thank you very much that you helped put together. Um, and that talked about those hidden costs, right? The, the, or at least indicated that we think we think it costs more to build on the build landscape and disturb landscape, but we don't we don't understand, like we don't actually pay nature for its services, right? And and we're not going to be able to get back those services that we, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot, basically. Um, so so that math is a different kind of math that that. Uh, usually, policy and legislation doesn't look at carefully because we don't we don't have that kind of math. We have like an abacus. You know, nature uses you know beyond quantum physics, and we're using a little abacus. Um, but okay, so there's that. The other thing is with your dual use section. I I haven't really. I mean, I haven't been here a lot because I I have class during most of the meetings, but um, I haven't really heard from. Uh, farmers informing you about their experience and their perspectives, the Ag Commission, CISA, you know, groups like that, because all the farmers I'm in touch with in, in my organizing work, uh, very few of them actually favor agrovoltaics. It's not, it's not most, most statements that I've read, most people that I'm, uh, that I'm talking to across the state, but here, here too, um, really don't, don't want that, um, except in certain cases where they they have to have that um, because they're you know they're they're struggling so much, um, and and most of the farmers don't own their land anyway, so uh, and they're not even benefiting from it. So that that's something I I'm just wondering about sort of kind of that blanket statement about supporting agrovoltaics. I don't really hear that support from the agricultural community. So I was I was wondering about that. Um, if if you've heard something from them at meetings I haven't been to that I don't know about. All right, let me um, appreciate that, Lenore. Um, I think the the notion there was that if it's voluntary, if a, if a farm a, a land landowner an agricultural landowner is pursuing solar, we would rather them go with a dual use array than not a dual use array. Ah, right. And we wouldn't stand in there. I see what you're saying, that they're they're seeking it out. It's not that you are you are marketing to developers <laughs> like, oh, here we are. Hey, take our farms. It's not that. Yeah, right? No, no. no. <laughs> okay. All right. That's I, I get sorry. That was obvious. No, no appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um uh we're out of time, but we'll continue a little bit for um, Scott, I think, has a, a comment. But Jack, did you have a, a, a feedback on Lenore's comment? What, yeah. Um, yeah, I think like I have two, but I think with the agrivoltaics that, you know, I, I would see that's a way of getting some potential farmland back into agricultural uh, production. Uh, you know, because we have a lot of fallow land that should be could be farmed potentially. And the agrivoltaics is, is certainly an option that might facilitate the increase, uh, you know, of of uh, farming in the area. Uh, and the other the other thing is is, and I agree with Lenore. There, there's a lot of information coming in, but one thing that bothers me, and I, I actually was talking to Steve uh, Roof about this, is that uh, again when we're talking about carbon sequestration, um, forests. You know, best case situation, we all agree. And then, you know, there's the built environment. But for, for me, I feel like the calculations are always missing uh, the important component that, that grassland has, which is essentially what's beneath the solar panel and and the soil there. It's it's not negligible. It's it's not as much as forest, but it's not negligible. It's actually <laughs> a lot. 
And I just never see that being accounted for uh, in these state documents. And it just, it kind of bothers me. Um, I, I don't know if Steve Roof has anything to add on that effect, but I have, I have a lot of articles on grassland pasture and their potential for carbon sequestration. Um, so I just, I just want to throw that out there because, you know, that, that is definitely always a strong argument for, for forests, but I think pastures get the short end of the stick uh, with regard to the benefit that they uh, provide. Good. Yeah. Th thanks, Jack, on that. Um, S S Scott, if you can let Scott and Stephanie and then um, we'll Scott, try to go ahead and unmute. Yep. Okay. Hi. Um, I had a couple comments on the, the draft bylaw that you all just went over. I'm not seeing, um, I did not see that online. Is Am I just missing it or, or where would I find a, a copy of the document that uh, the most recent version. So if you go to the Solar Bylaw Working Group's page, web page on the town's website, yep. there's a resources folder. Yeah. And when you click on the resources folder, there's meeting packets. And you go to today's date and it's in there. And okay. if you have any trouble, Scott, you can reach out to me directly and I'll help you and I'll make sure you get it. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Okay. Um Thanks everybody for the hard work uh, today. Thank you, Chris. I regret we didn't relieve your uh, voice <laughs> throughout that, but you're a very good reader. Uh, and so appreciate that. Um, and uh, let's come prepared. We have three hours to wrap this up on Tuesday morning uh, and um, look forward to, 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 um, to doing that. Um, at that point, we'll decide whether we need to figure out another meeting or not, but we're going to try to wrap things up. Um, Janet, a final thought? Unmute. I forgot to mention this earlier, but um, this Thursday at one o'clock, we rescheduled the Jake Marley field trip to the um, yeah. dual use site, um, which is off of, I think, Hawkins Road. I'll, I think maybe Stephanie can send that around again. It's apparently like you have to get in on the Hadley side and things like that. And we don't have to bring boots because it won't be muddy because it's going to be beautiful. So, I'd I'd be interested to know whether any of the rest of you are interested in going to that. That's now Thursday night, Janet. Thursday, Thursday at one o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I can't really make that. Yeah. I've yeah. been to the site before, but not since the array was built. Uh -huh. uh, I'll get there, but I I can't. Okay. I'll do it this Thursday. I might be there. Yeah. Calendar. Yeah, got to see how the broccoli is doing, right? Yeah, you will get some mine's lousy. <laughs> maybe, maybe some take-home gifts. Okay, all right. Okay, very good. Um, thanks everybody. Uh, Janet, if you can possibly get the minutes drafted to Stephanie ahead of time, that would be super. I'll, but I'll work on that. Okay. okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a good rest of the week, weekend, and uh, see you on Tuesday morning. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, y'all.